It's International Women's Day and this year's Women's Day is like no other as countries and communities start to slowly recover from a devastating pandemic. We have a chance to finally end the exclusion and marginalization of women and girls. But to do that, we need immediate action. Women must have the opportunity to play a full role in shaping the pivotal decisions being made right now as countries respond to and recover from the COVID-19 pandemic. This is according to the United Nations Development Programme. Now these are choices that will affect the well-being of people and the planet for generations to come. To do this, we must break down the deep-seated historic, cultural and socio-economic barriers that prevent women from taking their seat at the decision-making table to make sure that resources and power are more equitably distributed. Well, that's why Plus Politics today, we have women drawn from different countries around the world joining us live as we talk about setting the stage for women to step up to the plate and pave the way for those coming after them. This is Plus Politics, and I am Mariana Cohn. Women in Pakistan make up 48.76% of the population according to the 2017 census of Pakistan. Women in Pakistan have played an important role throughout Pakistan's history and they are allowed to vote in elections since 1956. In Pakistan, women have held high offices including that of the Prime Minister, Speaker of the National Assembly, Leader of the Opposition, as well as federal ministers, judges and serving commission posts in the armed forces. Major General Shahida Malik attaining the highest military post for a woman. The status of women in Pakistan after considerably across classes uh, differ considerably across classes, regions and rural, even urban divides due to the uneven socioeconomic development and the impact of tribal and feudal social formations on the lives of women in Pakistan. Gender Concerns International reports that the overall women's rights in Pakistan has improved with increasing number of women which are educated and literate. Joining me live from Pakistan is Wada Ifkitha. She's a development consultant, SDG Secretariat, National Assembly of Pakistan. Thank you, Wada, for joining us. Thank you for having me. All right. Well, let's go straight to it. Pakistan has been struggling, um, according to information that we're getting, to achieve gender equality in education. Uh, 13 million girls are out of school as of 2018. Um, what exactly is the challenge that we have, which has resulted to this number of children that are out of school? So, uh, as alarming as it is to say that 22.5 million children of school age are out of school, uh, what is more alarming is that two-thirds of it are, is girls. So, there are different factors that attribute to the fact, which could be uh, categorized as religious, then there are different cultural barriers, then given the social cultural uh, uh, systems that we have in, pla in place in Pakistan, pe parents do not feel comfortable in sending their ch uh, female children out to school just because of uh, constraints of uh, street harassment, issues of rape, and so uh, they kind of restrict them at home. And a lot of girls are um, working uh, uh, as domestic workers. So due to poverty, they find it useful that the money come, keeps coming in and the girls are not sent to school until unless government makes interventions where it ensures pri uh, not just free education, but it uh, provides some incentives to girls to attend schools, which has been very instrumental in a few case studies that have been implemented in few parts of the country. So the parts in the country in which these um, governments um, have implemented these uh, plans, is it mostly in the rural areas or in the urban areas? 
So uh, what it started off as private projects by different. I so do you hear my? Yes, we can hear. There you. is some disruptions. Okay. Okay. So it started off as pilot projects by different uh, social service organizations in Pakistan, where they would feed the girls, which would uh, not just because we don't have lack of education in Pakistan, but we have multi-dimensional problems, which uh, we have the highest uh, well, malnutrition rate in the world, probably, uh, which results in high more, uh, childbearing mortality because the the there's a high number of people who would, due to poverty, uh, marry off their ch girls at a young age. Mm -hmm. So it's not just one thing which is the problem. But so uh, I, what I was telling was that there were simple different NGOs who stepped in and they would uh, go to different communities based on their community needs because they are people who are from different religions and then they have different belief systems and then different cultures based on that. So uh, they would go to the community and tell them that maybe let's we'll educate your girl and we'll train them to do this and that, and in turn she'll be bringing uh, revenue to your uh, your home, hmm. and it did work out. So government did uh, pick up these practices that were in pockets and spurs across the country, and uh, not as uh, a general rule, but it's being implemented in parts where different um, cottage industries are in progress. Hmm. So yes, it's working. Okay. Uh, what is Women's March? Um, we hear about it, but what exactly is it and what are their demands? Is it just women marching for something? Well, that's a very interesting um, thing that happens in Pakistan since 2018. So women on 8th March take down on the streets of the country where they come out and uh, it's understand what it is like it's more of a festivity where the women take take up on the street and say this is our space we are equal citizens we demand equality in every means and way so we uh, we ask for equal justice system we ask for equal pays we ask for no street harassment uh, and different sorts so uh, it's very popular uh, in a way because uh, it it's the time of the year when uh, meaningful debates around gender equality begin in the country. They mm. take different courses. Uh, some go to the policy advocacy level at the parliamentary parliament level. Some stay in the news for good reasons. But this has helped a lot of things. For instance, we have been able to uh, make our cyber harassment law uh, and the workplace harassment law, which supports... Uh, uh, evidence generation for women in in case he reports a crime. Hmm. And this has all been a uh, result, result of the Aurat March itself. So we call it Aurat March in Pakistan, Aurat as in woman. Uh -huh. It's the Urdu word for uh, uh -huh. women. And uh, this year around, uh, since the theme was uh, the theme for the overall International Women's Day, it's choose to challenge. So uh, the Aurat March theme this year around was for the frontliners that they asked for uh, they asked for support for them so that they uh, can do whatever they want and feel safe and secure while doing so poverty eradication for them security for them since Pakistan is amongst the very few countries which still have live polio virus cases where frontline workers go door to door to uh, vaccinate people against it mm. and most of the wor uh, those workers are women so that's they're doing tremendous job and humongous jobs which no one wants to do it and no one and that that would that is what would take Pakistan out of that uh, blacklisted countries just because we we unfortunately have failed to uh, eradicate polio uh, which we should have done interesting Let's talk about gender equality in Pakistan because you also mentioned it that one of the reasons why the women are marching, obviously, is because they want their equal space, equal pay gap. So let's let's delve into that. That's a major issue. And it's not just Pakistan. It's across the world. Women are asking um, that the pay gap between them and men, you know, be closed up. Uh, what's the situation like in Pakistan? 
So uh, before I dig into that, I would uh, share a very interesting stats. In Pakistan, only 2% of the women, uh, the businesses are owned by women. However, 35% of the women have registered themselves as contributing workers. Hmm. So what is a contributing worker? A contributing worker is someone from the family who is helping you with the business, be it agriculture, be it your factory, be it anything but it's not get, getting a single penny out of it. So that's a huge amount of people who are working in the fields, are registered workers, but not getting paid for the work they're doing. Wow. Similarly, uh, when we talk about uh, women working in agriculture, because Pakistan is an agricultural country, there's a huge difference in what a woman is get, getting for the same amount of work she is doing as compared to a, her male counterpart. Okay. The uh, pandemic has exposed this even further because the work for women at home hasn't reduced. However, the outdoor work has been increased because we are an agricultural country. We could not cut it off completely. So, yes, uh, people are talking about it. Uh, as much as there needs to be talk about it, we need to be mindful of the fact that only 20% of Pakistan's parliament ha- is constitution constitutes of women. Wow. Meaning we don't have that kind of representation at the policy level where they tell where they can pro- probably take our stance onto the decision table. Oh, I'm so sorry, but we're going to just have to thank you. Warda Ifkita is uh, um, an executive working with the National Assembly in Pakistan under the SDGs. I'm thank so you very sorry. much I for not speaking even with us. Well, we, we have to let her go. Uh, thank you. We'll take a short break, and when we come back, we'll be talking to a woman from Nigeria. She is one of the firsts, and we'll tell you what she's first at. Stay tuned. <laughs> 